Thanks, Dr. Hanna, for this presentation. The presentation is about the diagnosis and treatment strategies of juvenile myeloma monocytic leukemia. The outline of the talk is about the overview of juvenile myeloma monocytic leukemia and its hematological features, the description of the RAS pathway and its role in driving juvenile myeloma monocytic disease, as well as the diagnostic criteria according to the WHO 2016, the recent genetic drivers involved in juvenile myeloma monocytic proliferation, as well as treatment strategies including hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and other non-transplant approaches. And last but not least is the Children's Cancer Hospital 57357 data analysis. Juvenile myeloma monocytic leukemia from historical perspective, it was presented early as cases of myeloid leukemia in infants and then with more uh, understanding for the pathogenesis of the disease, it was described for a while as chronic granulocytic leukemia of childhood and due to some similarity with other myeloproliferative disorders, it was uh, also named uh, for the more common disease which is uh, CML as a juvenile chronic myeloid leukemia. And the largest cohort uh, describing patients with a proposed criteria was uh, analyzed in 1997 from a German scientist who described chronic myelomonocytic leukemia in childhood analyzing 110 cases. So in general, it's a myeloproliferative myelodysplastic neoplasm where mutation in RAS pathway causes shunting to hematopoiesis towards the production of monocytes. There is an infrequent progression to plastic crisis in a specific acute myeloid leukemia, and more frequently, patients die from tissue infiltration of myeloid cells, especially pulmonary infiltrates in young age, causing respiratory failure. It's a rare diagnosis. It constitutes 1.6% of all hematological malignancies. The median age of diagnosis is less than two years, and it's more common in male and associated with many constitutional syndromes, including Noonan disorder and neurofibromatosis type 1 and other syndromes. It presents clinically with evidence of infiltrative proliferative disorder with splenomegaly and hepatomegaly, the most common presentation, pulmonary infiltrates, gut infiltrates with presenting with diarrhea, skin rash with eczematous eruptions, as well as juvenile sensor granulomatous legions, and even lymphadenopathy occur in 50% of cases with bleeding tendency like ecumotic patches and even active bleeding. Hematologically, patients usually that is diagnosed by a peripheral blood smear, which is the main corner for diagnosis, showing striking monocytosis often with dysplastic cell forms, as well as immature myelocytes, metamyelocytes, and nucleated RBCs, and peripheral uh, blood loss ranging from 2% and really exceed 20%. Thrombocytopenia also exists in almost 14% of cases. The hemoglobin level is usually normal. It, it's usually normal cytic feature if it occurs. And with monosomy 7, it presents usually with macrocytosis. There is elevated fetal hemoglobin, and autoantibodies usually exist with increased antinuclear antibody titer and other autoantibodies, as well as hypergammaglobinemia in 50% of cases. Bone marrow aspirate is not mandatory to diagnose juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia, but it's rather complementary uh, to uh, exclude uh, acute myeloid leukemia progression. The most common cytogenetic uh, association with juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia is having a normal karyotype in two thirds of cases. Monosomy 7 occurs in 25% of cases where patients present usually with lower median white blood cell count as well as moderate or normal uh, uh, hemoglobin F level. So it's not an easy disease to diagnose with non-specific clinical presentation and its clinical picture is usually mimicked by a lot of disorders, especially viral infection like Epstein-Barr viruses or even some of acute myeloid leukemias that like those associated with KMT, uh, KM2A rearrangement which present with uh, low blast count as well as hepatosplenomegaly, some of the immune deficiency disorder like whiskey aldrich syndrome and the infantile malignant osteopetrosis where leukoerythroplastic features are almost similar to what presents in uh, juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia. The most common five genes detected to date for RAS mutations for, uh, and pathway regulators 
uh, includes those with uh, including the NRAS as well as those including KRAS and some of the recurators including PTPN11 and CPL gene mutation and the tumor suppressor gene neurofibromine and these five genes usually exist in uh, 85 to 90 percent of patients and some of them are somatic and some are germline which exist in hematopoietic and non-hematopoietic cell like the CPL and, uh, and neurofibromatosis type 1. They are mutually exclusive so the presence of one of these mutations is enough to diagnose and exclude the presence of others as well as it leads to activation of the RAS regulatory pathway. The diagnostic criteria according to 2016 include category 1 where it should be all available to start suspecting that this patient might be a juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia which is absence of PCR able fusion gene as well as peripheral blood monocytes is more than 1000 less than 20 percent plus in, in, in peripheral blood and, and bone marrow as well as splenomegaly which is characteristic for this disease and then category 2 only one of them is sufficient to diagnose uh, a patient like a juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia beside uh, the clinical and hematological features just named to have somatic mutation in KRAS, NRAS, PTPN11, to have clinical diagnosis of NF1, and to have germline CPL mutation. While category 3, we tend to do it if there is no genetic studies done, like in a lot of developing countries, or if there is uh, negative uh, mutations done which occur in 10% of patients, so we will depend on the cytogenetics. And if a patient has a monosomy 7 or any other clonal chromosomal abnormality, then that's enough to diagnose a patient as a juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia beside category 1. But if he has a normal karyotype, so we need at least two of the following increased hemoglobin F as well as myeloid or erythroid precursors in peripheral blood and the spontaneous growth of granulocytic macrophage in clonal assay, as well as the recently added hyperphosphorylation of STAT5 gene. So it's very important to differentiate the germline from somatic. That's important because uh, we need to have genetic analysis in leukemic cell to, uh, to say this is a somatic disorder and as well to exclude in other non-hematopoietic tissue like hair follicles, like uh, skin biopsies. That's mandatory because germline disorders in, include in PTPN11, KRAS or NRAS mutation have a milder clinical course and are, uh, are diagnosed under other differential diagnosis, including other cardiovascular cutaneous disorders or Noonan syndrome, which don't need the aggressive treatment or transplant. The CPL germline mutation is one of the uh, included criteria in juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia. It, its myeloproliferative disorder is often self-resolving as listed in a lot of literature, as well as it can have a cafe au lait patches that can sometimes be misleading for NF1, but NF1 needs more than six legions with uh, a size of more than 0.5 millimeter in size, and it's associated with autoimmune phenomena, especially anti-double stranded DNA, as well as vasculitis, uh, and this vasculitis occur in long-term survivals, and even transplant is debated if it can reverse these vasculitic disorders that occur later on. And as I said, that some people tend to just watch these patients, they resolve spontaneously. So stem cell is indicated according to chromosomal aberration if it exists or if the patient progresses. What about juvenile myeloblocytic leukemia without a known RAS mutation pathway, which occurs in like around 10 to 20 percent? There is alternative mechanism for activating downstream signal that proliferates the granulocytic macrophage colonies, including the ROS ALK pathway, where there is tyrosine kinase fusions that were detected uh, a couple of years ago, and this, uh, this activation of, of the ROS or ALK uh, gene leads to downstream signaling that leads to survival advantage of granulocytic series in comparison to what happens in RAS pathway. And crizutinib, which is an alcross inhibitor that's used in a lot of solid tumor malignancies, it's, it shows a promising uh, response in patients with alcross fusion positive JMML, as well as in chemotherapy resistant cases. Also, what's included in the criteria for patients who have a negative gene mutation is the granulocytic macrophage spontaneous clonal. Uh, 
cloidal uh, proliferation, which is a hallmark of this disease. And for many years, it was used in a lot of labs to diagnose patients with juvenile male monocytic leukemia, showing just clonal rapid uh, reproduction of this uh, granulocytic macrophage. But this occurs also in other viral infections like cytomegalovirus, and there is, as I say, is not standardized among lab to date. So, Jack. STAT pathway, which is right now also included uh, in, in, in the diagnostic criteria, it a little bit more decently uh, reproduce what happens in the granulocyte macrophage than just clonal culture. So it documents that hyperphosphorylation of a STAT5 leads to uh, this rapid progression of granulocytic series. And even JAK2 inhibitors like roxalitinib show a promising result in some cases of juvenile male monocytic leukemias. So should all JMML cases be offered transplant in general? Yes, as it's the only curative option for patients to date. With a median survival without transplant, not more than 10 years, and a five year overall survival around 50%. Even the genetic subtypes differ according to their behavior, where we can have a somatic PTPN mutation. It's rapidly fatal without transplant and they have high probability of relapse even after transplantation. While somatic NRAS mutations, there are two biologically different uh, disorders. Those who happen in older age with high level of hemoglobin F, they tend to progress rapidly and relapse even after transplant. And others that occur in infants or in cases with point mutation in G12S have an indolent course with spontaneous regression to their disease. Somatic KRAS mutation mostly occurs in infants. They show an aggressive behavior at presentation, but tend to, less, to improve after transplant with less incidence of relapse. Children with NF1 are fatal without allogenic stem cell transplantation and usually present in a very poor general condition. As well as patient with uh, last germ, germline CPL mutation, the value of allogenic stem cell transplant in some of the literature is still uncertain, and some of patients who are transplanted occur have high frequency of mixed chimerism after transplant, and even they can do well with this mixed chimeric status. So the indication of trans stem cell transplantation, according to subgroup, we need to differentiate somatic subtypes, as well as to differentiate, I will try to use the pointer, yes it works, the somatic mutation, if it's somatic in PTPN11, KRAS, NRAS, so I need to rapidly transplant the patient appropriately if there is a donor. While if I'm having a germline mutation, then I need to suspect other, uh, other dis my, uh, transient myeloproliferative disorders, and I will watch and wait, and if there is aggressive progression, mild chemotherapy could solve this problem. If I'm having a germline mutation in NF1, this patient is an aggressive juvenile immunocytic leukemia and needs a prop transplantation and if it's a germline CPL also it's a GMML but we will watch and wait maybe rapid progression might occur and if disease progressed he will move on transplantation. As mentioned that the relapse is a common event post transplant with relapse rate around 30 to 60 percent it occurs early according to the European working oncology group not more than six months. A second allograph is recommended and can rescue one third of relapsing cases. Still, some potential risk factors are associated with poor risk, with poor manifestation and poor outcome even after transplant, including age, where in all studies older age have high risk for relapse, and the age cutoff more than two years or more than four years still debatable, but the worst is above four years. Female gender also is a risk criteria, Thrombocytopenia below 50,000, and in systematic review, a lot of studies mentioned below 33,000. Elevated hemoglobin F is still a trend for a poor prognosis. Monosomy 7, according to a study done, uh, including most of the centers, the Eurocode, EBMT, and the European Working Oncology Group, and CIBMTR, showed that patients who have monosomy 7 after cord transplantation uh, have a disease-free survival much worse than patients who, who doesn't have this uh, monosomal disorder. While according to the EBMT and uh, European Worker Encourage Group, if a patient have a matched family donor or matched unrelated donor, the outcome of monosomy 7 it, uh, is the same and comparable to those with normal karyotype or uh, those with other abnormal cytogenetics.
Epigenetic changes and hypermethylation of DNA in juvenile male monocytic leukemia is, is, is right now a figure for an aggressive juvenile male monocytic variant, and it's usually associated with clinical risk factors like older age, elevated hemoglobin level, as well as PTPN11 and NF1, and it plays a role in clonal evolution to acute myeloid leukemia in patients who have this hypermethylation in their promoter region, as well as they found that patient who acquire higher methylated phenotype at relapse even when compared to those uh, at diagnosis. And just published this, uh, this, uh, this data showing that DNA methylation is high in patients who show poor phenotype like BTPN11 and NF1. Like here, those with high they show NF1 and BTPN11, while low methylation was more in patients who show rapid resolution like NRAS, CPL, and Nonan disorder, and this was correlated to cumulative incidence of relapse. The higher the methylation of DNA, the more probability of relapse. Stem cell source by itself, it didn't differ in, in the outcome, either matched family donor, peripheral blood, bone marrow, or coat. While conditioning differs, despite for children, uh, and they are usually very young age, so we avoid TBI-based regimens, and we transplant those patients with busulfan, but not only to avoid the long-term side effects, but because busulfan including regimen show a better outcome regarding event-free survival and relapse probability, as well as, as published here by the Japanese Society of stem cell transplantation showing that bioflumen, which is a standard in most centers for uh, juvenile immunogenetic transplant, is better than the TPI, including myeloablative conditioning, regarding the probability of overall survival and event-free survival, with much great difference between them, of course. As well as they showed that patients who suffered from chronic GVHD did well regarding also the event-free survival and their cumulative incidence of relapse compared to patients who didn't have chronic GVHD during their course of treatment. What about the other non-transplant treatment approach? Still, there is no clear data or comparative evaluation regarding their efficacy, but splenectomy being patients usually present with huge spleen it's not indicated for all patients, and neither the size nor uh, spirinectomized or not spirinectomized differ in the outcome uh, across all studies. Also, pre-transplant chemotherapy has shown here that acute myeloid leukemia-like chemotherapy or even low-dose chemotherapy or patients who didn't receive treatment uh, didn't differ on overall survival, event-free survival and relapse uh, when we move to transplant, despite others didn't show this result and show that chemotherapy differs. And this interesting study that was published last year that showed the response and they, they divided the patient according to mutational monitoring after giving them chemotherapy and they followed their mutational allelic frequency just at diagnosis and at the end of treatment before transplantation, and they classified their patients to molecular responders and molecular non-responders according to the chemotherapy given, and they showed that patients who had molecular responders had 100% uh, progression-free survival compared to molecular non-responders, and their classification of this, is a, there were seven patients out of 21 patients. Most of them received moderate intensity acute myeloid leukemia-like, and just one patient of them received as a cytidine and it had a, a, a decline in its allelic frequency to 0% compared to uh, those who received 6MP, none of them showed any response. And what's also interesting is the detection of this flat 3 recurrent fusion. And this patient was resistant to the moderate intensity chemotherapy, acute myeloid leukemia like, and responded after giving it sorafenib and went into molecular remission. And same gene was described same year in, in an, a different publication described that patient was chemotherapy resistant and then received sorafenib and both sorafenib was maintained on sorafenib as a cytidine until transplant and they were recommending doing this, this fusion gene in patients who have negative molecular mutation. Also, DNA hypomethylating agent as a cytidine show promising result as bridging to transplant as well as effect in targeting leukemia-initiating cells 
and induce hematological and molecular remission in many studies. And there is an open clinical trial conducted on newly diagnosed cases of juvenile malignant monocytic leukemia and MDSs. The children's cancer data showed that from June 2007 to June 2019, with a follow-up for six months, we have total patient uh, who presented to 57357 were 90 cases of juvenile cases, which is a big number, with inclusion of 87 uh, cases, and we executed three in our data analysis because two died before start of treatment and one refused treatment. Most were male, gender, constituting around 70% of our cases, and age category, most more than 70% were below two years at presentation, and even uh, and when subtypes uh, when subtype uh, below one year were around 30 percent uh, including 27 cases the most common karyotype was normal karyotype and monosomy 7 and deletion 7q occurred in 25 percent of cases rest mutation were done in our whole cohort in in in, in 47 uh, cases where eight showed uh, negative mutation and was not done in 13 cases and when we compare our uh, the, the percentage in, in our center compared to the international study, we can find that PTPN11 has higher, uh, has lower uh, prevalence of 29% compared to 38 internationally, as well as NF1 is on the high uh, average percentage. And the distribution of mutations by age, we can see that below two years, we have the NRAS, the PTPN11, as well as the KRAS mutation was the main mutation involved as well as most of all CPL patients were below two years and none were above two years. While what was interesting is the NF1 cases, which is usually in most literature, it's listed for patients who are of older age. Here we have the, most of them uh, below uh, two years of age. And even when we subtyped our patient below one year, still NF1 uh, is one of the predominating uh, mutations existing. Uh, or clinical NF1 was one of the uh, mutations existing, as well as PTPN11 declined significantly from below two years from 12 cases to just 12 cases remaining. Chemotherapy were given, were in the form of uh, 83 cases received treatment, 39 received acute myeloid leukemia like, 19 received flodarabin, RAC, and azacitidine, 17 received flodarabin, RAC, and low dose chemotherapy, and 8 cases received azacitidine and low dose chemotherapy, and 4 cases didn't receive any treatment. We transplanted 30 cases because, as mentioned before by Dr. Iman Sedhom, that we transplant patients from matched sibling donor while others we don't have registry for month transplantation. So transplanted were 34% of our patients with an outcome uh, of 58.4% for five years of our all survival compared to 23 for non-transplanted, which is explainably different. And regarding the age and transplant, it didn't differ when it was a cut of two years, as well as the karyotype, the initial total leukocytic count, and the initial uh, absolute uh, macrocytic count, uh, absolute monocytic count, it didn't differ. The AML-like therapy compared to other types of therapy given, it showed more association with uh, deaths, with more deaths, despite the difference this didn't reflect on the overall survival or the event-free survival, despite having lower survival than those who receive other types of treatment. Regarding transplanted patients, we, we can see that most of transplanted NRAS cases, none of them died post-transplant. We, we transplanted seven cases, six were alive, and despite the small numbers, none of the KRAS or CPL patients who were transplanted were dead after transplantation. Chronic GVHD also didn't differ, despite it differs in a lot of other series. Here there was difference with improvement in chronic graft versus host disease, but not statistically significant. What was interesting, interesting in our cohort is that for patients who were not transplanted and, and didn't receive transplant and ended their chemotherapy treatment, 14 patients went into uh, complete hematological remission with a median follow-up of 31.6 months. Those 14 patients, 13 cases received treatment, seven in the form of fluorarabine, RSC, and azacitidine. Three cases were received acute myeloid leukemia-like, 
and two patients received flodarab and RSC and low dose chemotherapy, and one patient received azacitidine followed, followed by low dose chemotherapy, while one patient received no treatment at all. The cytogenetic and RASP mutation for the patient who went on remission, we have five CPL cases who went to remission, four of them had normal karyotype, and we have five KRASP mutation with four of them have monosomy 7 karyotype. So the summary of my talks, it's juvenile melanocytic leukemia is an aggressive disease that show uncontrollable proliferation of monocytic granulocytic cells. Hyperactivation of RAS signaling is the pathogenesis of juvenile melanocytic leukemia in 90% of cases. Other genetic drivers are recently discovered. Allogenic stem cell transplantation is still the only therapeutic option. Watch and wait could be a strategy for CPL mutation cases and few of the NRSS cases. 5 azacitidine is a promising drug for reducing disease burden and disease control, both in pre-transplant window and non-transplant setting. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, when when we, you talk about not receiving treatment, yes, no treatment at all or treatment on palliative no. basis uh, like retinoic acid, 6MP, for, for example. Okay, I meant, I meant without stem cell transplantation with chemotherapy only, and I differentiated 13 cases received treatment. That's the type of treatment given. And low-dose chemotherapy means, means, as you mentioned, like 6MP, like Roaccutane, it's low-dose chemotherapy. It's difficult because it's heterogeneous, so I collected them in, 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 in subgroups. And just one case didn't receive treatment. Yes, because I have two, two patients without treatment and they survived. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's, not sur it's not survival, it's hematological remission. That's what I mean, no, no, no spleen, complete hematological response. Yes, but they are still living. Yeah, not, not living in, we have more cases living. I mean living in complete hematological remission, normalized yeah. total leukocytic count. Yeah. No spleen. And they are. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Ahmoud, for this great presentation. Um, as you mentioned, um, there is a high DNA methylation of those with unfavorable molecular features, and uh, those unfavorable molecular features associated with high risk of relapse post transplant. Do you think that adding High methylating agent like azacitidine was transplant maintenance for like one year and have an impact to reduce the relapse and such patients. Okay, first hypermethylation, as you mentioned, yes, and azacitidine is proven for uh, for bridging pre transplant. Post transplant, it's not standardized, despite as you said, some people for patients who have hypermethylation up front, but it needs to, you need to know before transplantation as the patient is having hypermethylation, they give the yes, post-transplant maintenance. But it's still not standardized, but still. for the excellent presentation. My question might be a bit out of scope because as a new oncologist, I just wonder how many cases of the NF1 positive uh, mutations cases uh, did have uh, other uh, red tumors or other... Uh, I have one case. Uh, to my knowledge, one case and progress, yeah, but it, it came with juvenile melanocytic leukemia post brain tumor. It was it had a glioma and it, this patient is, is died. Like without transplantation. Okay, yeah, because, because uh, there are some some reports in literature uh, excluding, especially in the uh, the lunar syndrome. There are few reports about association with lunar glioma gliomas as well. Yes. But uh, there's some uh, uh, debate whether it is a mutual exclusion when you present with a glioma, you don't present with a juvenile melanocytic leukemia or not. All, all of my patients are non syndromatic non lunar. Yes, Nuna should be differentiated from the beginning, as, as I mentioned. It has a typical uh, presentation with its transient paleoproliferation. 
and also the mutation occurs in the PTPN, which is the commonest uh, abnormality, but we can differentiate it with the germline and some syndromatic features associated. None of ours are. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you. 